Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alan Schenken and I have the honour of being the President of the British Nutrition Foundation. Firstly, I have to thank you, ma'am, for once again attending and participating in our annual day. Your patronage and your frequent attendance at our events demonstrates your personal commitment to improving the nation's health and its diet. And it is of great encouragement to all of us at the BNF, so thank you very much indeed. And I would also like to welcome all of our guests, many of whom have travelled some distance to be here with us today. We now move to the uh, prize lecture for this year, which was, um, has been given by Professor Philip Calder. Now, Philip Calder received his early education in New Zealand, and following his BSc in biochemistry there, he joined the team at Oxford for his PhD and his postdoctoral work. He subsequently joined the Institute of Nutrition at the University of Southampton, and there he has developed a formidable research reputation in the important new developing field of nutritional immunology, which is the interaction of nutritional status on immune function. There is no time to summarize his extensive publication list, nor the many prizes he's won and the distinguished roles he has held in various committees, etc. Some of these are in your programme. But as the BNF prize winner of last year, he is now invited to deliver this year's annual lecture. His title is Omega-3, The Good Oil, and I now invite Philip to address us. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> it's a great uh, honour and a great pleasure for me to be asked to deliver the BNF annual lecture uh, this year, um, and I really want to thank the Foundation for giving me the opportunity to showcase some of the work that we've been doing in, uh, in Southampton over the last uh, 20 years or so, I guess. Um, so I chose this uh, probably a bit unusual title, Omega-3, The Good Oil, um, because a lot of the work that we've been doing has been on omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are associated with particular foods and particular supplements. Um, and these foods and supplements through both epidemiology and randomized controlled trials have been shown to uh, be important in uh, maintaining and improving uh, human health. <clears throat> so the foods that omega-3s are most uh, highly associated with are seafoods, particularly uh, fish and especially fatty fish or oily fish like salmon, tuna, uh, sardines and so on. Um, and the supplements uh, that contain omega-3s are typically called uh, fish oils. <clears throat> now, fish oils are never far from the eye of the media. So this is a random uh, collection of some uh, media activities around fish oils. Fish oils cut the risk of heart attack. Uh, family credits fish oil with healing teens, badly injured brain, and fish oil saved my marriage, which I think is my favourite uh, quote about fish oil of all time. Now, in my presentation, I'm going to say a little bit about this area of cardiovascular disease, um, but the point is that all three of these areas are actually areas of uh, important research activity, and there is evidence that omega-3 fatty acids can play a role in these areas. So... This area may not be clear to you what it is. It turns out that this lady had some uh, depressive illness that was affecting uh, her whole life, and she was treated with omega-3s, and that made uh, uh, the situation better. So that area is actually a big area of uh, scientific research. So what are omega-3 fatty acids? Well, to explain that, I just have to take you through a little bit of basic fatty acid structure in a couple of slides. So fatty acids have this basic structure. They're a string of carbon atoms joined together. At one end of that, that string or chain is this carboxylic acid group that's usually linked to something else. And at the other end of the chain is um, this methyl group, CH3 group. The carbon chain can vary from a few carbons to as many as 30. 
The other um, aspect of the structure of this chain is that it can have double bonds inserted into it, and that changes the physical properties of, uh, of the fatty acid. So a fatty acid with no double bonds in the chain is called a saturated fatty acid. A fatty acid with one or more double bonds is an unsaturated fatty acid. Two or more double bonds, this is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. So omega-3 fatty acids are a family of long chain, that is, they have 18 plus carbons in that chain, highly unsaturated, that is, they have three or more double bonds in the chain. The name omega-3 is a chemical descriptor. It tells you about the position of one of those double bonds, the one that's closest to the metal end of the uh, carbon chain. There are many members of the family that are listed here, but the ones I'm going to mention are uh, particularly uh, eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA, and I'm also going to mention alpha linolenic acid along the way. As you'll see, the different members of the family have different dietary sources, but they are all metabolically and obviously structurally related to one another. These are the structures of EPA and DHA, shown in a slightly different way from uh, previously, but you see this is the string of carbon atoms joined together. EPA has 20 carbons and five double bonds. DHA has 22 carbons and six double bonds. And the terminal double bond is on carbon number three, counting from the methyl end. This is the metabolic pathway by which the simplest omega-3 fatty acid, that is alpha-linolenic acid, 18 carbons with three double bonds, can be converted to EPA, and then EPA can be converted onto DHA. Obviously, this pathway involves what's called elongation of the chain, that is adding more carbons to the chain. So we go from an 18 carbon down to a 22 carbon fatty acid. And secondly, the metabolic pathway involves the insertion of more double bonds, that's called desaturation going from a three double bonded all the way down to a six double bonded um, uh, fatty acid. <clears throat> Although this pathway exists for reasons which are not fully understood, it doesn't operate very efficiently in most humans who have been studied. So the consensus at the moment is that EPA and especially DHA are very poorly synthesized in humans. So if they're important for health, dietary sources will be very important of preformed EPA and DHA. So the dietary sources of EPA and DHA, as I said, are seafood, especially oily fish, but they're also available in, in, in supplements like fish oils, algal oils, and actually some pharmaceutical preparations. In contrast, the simpler omega-3 fatty acids are synthesized in plants and are found in plant uh, tissues like seeds, nuts, and some oils. If we look at the EPA and DHA content of different types of fish, um, this is uh, data for uh, five different types of fish. We see that there's uh, a 10 or 20-fold difference in the amount of EPA and DHA across the fish shown here. So lean fish or white fish like cod and haggock, haddock provide perhaps 150 to 300 milligrams per portion, whereas oily fish like salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, and so on provide 10 times more than that. So it's really the oily fish that are the best sources of these fatty acids. <clears throat> it's important to realize that, just like us, fish are not good at making EPA and DHA. And EPA and DHA in fish is, uh, accumulates through the food chain, and it's actually the marine microalgae that synthesize EPA and DHA in the first place. So what that means is the exact contents of these fatty acids in different types of fish will actually depend upon the diet of the fish, the season, the geographical location, and so on. If we look at supplements, we also see a large variety in the total amount of EPA and DHA. This is milligrams per gram of oil, going from a couple of hundred milligrams per gram of oil, that would be a typical one gram capsule of the supplement in cod liver oil, all the way up to almost uh, 1,000 milligrams one gram in a one gram capsule for some of the pharmaceutical preparations. It's important in passing to note that there's a second family of polyunsaturated fatty acids called the omega-6 family, they're shown here, and that there's direct competition for metabolism between the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acid families. So the balance between omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids is important for some considerations. 
If we look at typical dietary intakes of these fatty acids, this is uh, uh, the typical sort of data that would be reported in uh, Western populations like the UK. Uh, so these are the two omega-6 fatty acids that are most prevalent in the diet. So an adult, on average, is eating about 10 grams of linoleic acid per day from plant sources and about half a gram of arachidonic acid. Uh, one gram of the plant omega-3 fatty acid and about 0.1 gram of EPA and DHA. So there's a big variation in the amounts of these fatty acids that are consumed. EPA and DHA intake will be much higher in regular fish eaters, especially oily fish eaters, and will be higher in users of fish oil supplements. In common with all dietary fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids are digested and absorbed in the gut. They appear in the bloodstream in uh, these complexes called lipoproteins, which deliver the fatty acids to different uh, locations in the body, for example, to the adipose tissue for storage, to the liver for further metabolism, and to all other cells and tissues where the fatty acids play very important roles in uh, cell membranes. So we can consider these to be um, uh, transport, functional storage, and metabolic pools of fatty acids. So we've been interested in looking at the omega-3 fatty acid content of different uh, locations in the human body. Um, so this is an example of data looking at human uh, immune cells taken from the blood. This is the proportional contribution of different omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids to the total fatty acids that are present. So the total would be 100%. So you see there's about 30% or more omega-6 fatty acids and about 3% of omega-3 fatty acids. So there's 10 times more omega-6 than omega-3. And in the diet, there's roughly 10 times more omega-6 than omega-3. So these two things are related to one another. Here I've calculated what the effect of taking omega-3 supplements or eating salmon would be on a daily intake of EPA and DHA. So in the background diet, we're consuming 0.1 or 0.2 uh, grams per day. By eating a meal of salmon, we can increase that perhaps tenfold. So people can easily greatly increase their omega-3 intake simply by eating more oily fish. Of course, by taking supplements, depending upon the amounts of EPA and DHA in the supplement, we can greatly increase EPA and DHA intake. So it is possible to improve intake of these fatty acids. The important question, of course, is what is the health impact of increasing intake of EPA and DHA? And to start to talk about that, we need to go back to the beginning of the history of the omega-3 story, which is the Greenland Inuits. So um, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Danish researchers became very interested in disease prevalence in the Greenland uh, native population. And one of the things they were interested in was cardiovascular disease, and this is data from one paper, but it's been reported many times over. Based upon Danish figures for uh, incidence of myocardial infarction, heart attack, um, the, uh, what was seen in the Greenland Inuits was about 10% of what was expected. So they had huge protection against cardiovascular disease. And this was traced eventually to the diet of uh, the uh, native Inuits. They ate a lot of seal meat, whale meat, whale blubber, and fish. All of those things contain a lot of EPA and DHA. They had a massive intake of these fatty acids, perhaps 100 times more than uh, people in the room are eating. Uh, so this was a massive intake and seemed to be protective against cardiovascular disease and some other uh, conditions. This is data from a US uh, epidemiological cohort, the Nurses' Health Cohort, uh, where they looked at the diet of these nurses when they were uh, middle-aged and disease-free, and then they followed them for a period of time, and the outcome here was did they develop coronary heart disease, did they die from coronary heart disease, and did they have a myocardial infarction that was uh, not fatal. And what the researchers reported was the higher the intake of EPA and DHA in the diet, so the risk of these cardiovascular outcomes was decreased by as much as 50% or so. So that's EPA and DHA in the diet uh, protecting against cardiovascular disease. This is a similar epidemiological study from the Physicians Health Cohort, this time measuring the amounts of EPA and DHA in blood and relating uh, those amounts when uh, the study participants were disease-free 
to the risk of sudden death over the follow-up period. So sudden death is due to myocardial infarction. And what the researchers demonstrated again was that there's a dose-dependent <laughs> reduction in sudden death as EPA and DHA content of the blood is increased. How can that, those observations be explained? Well, we have to look at the cardiovascular disease risk factors, of course, and a lot of research over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, including much research done by some people in this room, uh, has demonstrated that these fatty acids uh, impact beneficially on quite a range of risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So they have a small blood pressure lowering effect, they lower blood triglycerides, which are a type of fat in the blood. They improve the function of the blood vessel wall. They reduce the likelihood of clot formation. They decrease inflammation. So they seem to reduce uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease through improving the profile of risk factors. So what these data are telling us is that having more EPA and DHA in the blood, but also in cells and tissues, is linked to improved health. And I've used the example of cardiovascular disease. So we need to understand a lot more about the relationship between intake of EPA and DHA and the appearance of those fatty acids in the blood and in cells and tissues. So we've been very interested in that for a long time now. So again, this is looking at uh, human blood immune cells in uh, healthy volunteers supplemented with fish oil capsules for three months. That's the period of the yellow line here. This is the amount of EPA and the amount of DHA in those cells at the start of the study, and you see that after four weeks or so, there's quite a large increase in both EPA and DHA status. That's maintained during the supplementation period, and then when the supplementation is stopped and we go back eight weeks later, um, the EPA has gone back to uh, baseline and the DHA has started to go back. So there's some sort of time course of incorporation of these fatty acids. And there's also a dose-dependent uh, effect. So here we gave, again, healthy volunteers supplements containing different amounts of EPA for, uh, for three months. And this is the change in EPA, again, in the blood immune cells uh, as a function of these increasing intakes. So you see there's a linear dose-response relationship between the amount that's consumed and the amount that appears in these cells. And this has been reported for many different cell types in the blood and uh, to a lesser extent for some tissues in humans. So we were very interested in the dose and time course uh, incorporation of EPA and DHA in humans. Um, so <clears throat> we carried out a study collaboratively, uh, coincidentally with, uh, with Susan Jebb uh, from, uh, when she was in Cambridge, um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about this study. It was funded by uh, the Food Standards Agency. Um, <clears throat> it has a very interesting study design. Um, so we had five groups, parallel design, stratified by age and sex, a control group, and then four groups who had increased intake of EPA and DHA uh, for one year. This was a one-year intervention. 210 people in total uh, randomized across these five groups. And um, one of these groups took the omega-3 fatty acids just on one day of the week. Another one took them on two days of the week. And another one took them on four days of the week to try to mimic what would happen if a person ate fish once a week, twice a week, and four times a week. And there's another group where we were looking at a slightly different way of providing those fatty acids. <clears throat> so just going back to this uh, diagram from before, we have transport pools in the blood. We have functional pools in cell membranes, and we have a storage pool of these fatty acids. So in this study that we did with Susan, we were interested in how EPA and DHA got into all of those different pools. So we looked at different plasma lipids, that's lipids in the blood, platelets, red blood cells, immune cells from the blood. These are cells from uh, inside the cheek of the mouth, and these are, this is adipose tissue biopsies. So we were looking at... Uh, transport pools, functional pools, and storage pools. And we took these samples several times over one year. So this is the way we showed the data. So this is appearance of DHA in one of the blood lipid pools, plasma phosphatidylcholine, over one year. This is the control group. They weren't taking omega-3s, and you see there's no change in DHA. This is the group taking uh, omega-3s equivalent to one portion per day, 
to, sorry, one portion of fish per week, two portions per week, and four portions per week. So you see this is a nice dose-response relationship. So what we were able to do is look at those nine different pools in the body for both EPA and DHA at these different doses and over one year. So we were able to document the time and dose dependence of the incorporation of these fatty acids in different pools in the body. What we did essentially was we showed there is a linear dose response relationship in all of those different pools, six of them are shown here, but the nature of the dose dependence, so the slope of the line is different according to the different pools. But the bottom line is that the amounts of EPA and DHA being consumed are strongly reflected in the amounts of those fatty acids in blood, cell and tissue lipids. So I started talking about health effects, then I was talking about incorporating omega-3 fatty acids. So there has to be a link to this increased exposure, that is intake of fatty acids and appearance of fatty acids in the blood and in cells, and the health outcome. And um, this is depicting events going on in a cell membrane, and essentially the incorporation of EPA and DHA into cell membranes changes many things about the physical nature of the membrane, the functionality of the membrane, the biosynthesis of particular chemicals produced out of the membrane. All of these things are signals that change how cells and tissues respond. And through the alteration of these signals and the consequent changes in cell and tissue functionality or responses, omega-3 fatty acids impact on physiology and pathophysiology to improve health and bring about better clinical outcome. So through their actions, as depicted on the previous slide, omega-3 fatty acids influence metabolism, inflammation, immune responses, oxidative stress, platelet reactivity, blood coagulation, how the blood vessel wall is functioning, the function of organs like the liver, the heart, the muscle and the brain, wound healing, and many, many other things. So they're really fundamentally important to, uh, to human health. One of the things that I think is very important is translation of basic science findings to uh, the public and to patients. Um, so we've done a lot of studies in different patient groups. Um, so I just want to tell you about one, one of our studies uh, now. Um, <clears throat> so this is a schematic of the build-up of a fatty atherosclerotic plaque in a blood vessel wall. Um, so this happens over many decades. Uh, the process by which that happens is um, very well understood. This latter phase here is what's referred to as narrowing of the arteries or hardening of the arteries. This is what causes heart disease, can lead to stroke and so on. The acute event can be the rupture, that is the breaking of the atherosclerotic plaque. That's depicted here. So when a plaque ruptures, you get uh, a blood clot formed at the site of the rupture, a thrombus, and that can cut off blood flow. And that's what's seen here in a cross-section of a coronary artery from somebody who's died as a result of a heart attack. So there was an atherosclerotic plaque here. It ruptured at this site here. This thrombus is formed, and blood flow to the heart has been cut off, and the person has died as a result of that. Two other interesting things on the slide. <clears throat> the first is that the process of um, plaque rupture is driven by inflammatory activity within the blood vessel wall. And many experiments, including many experiments done by us, have demonstrated that omega-3 fatty acids reduce inflammation. They're anti-inflammatory. So it's possible if we can get omega-3 fatty acids into the blood vessel wall, they will dampen this inflammation and reduce the likelihood of plaque rupture from happening. And that could be very important. The other thing that's interesting is this Italian randomized controlled trial. In patients who had had a myocardial infarction but survived, they were given omega-3 fatty acids or control uh, in this particular study for one year, but actually the study was three and a half years long. This is total mortality. Um, and what it shows is, this is the control group here, and this is the omega-3 group, is that omega-3, patients receiving omega-3 fatty acids are protected against mortality compared to control. So um, it's possible that this 
effect can be reduced by omega-3 fatty acids, and it's possible that that could be because of dampened inflammation in the blood vessel wall. So we were very interested in this question of stabilizing advanced atherosclerotic plaques through exposure to omega-3 fatty acids, through their well-known anti-inflammatory effects. So we wanted to find a way to look at that. Um, so we worked with um, our vascular surgeons in Southampton to carry out two studies in patients awaiting or undergoing the surgical procedure, which is called carotid end arthrectomy. This is um, removal of advanced atherosclerotic plaques from the carotid artery. So this is one of our patients, and this is the carotid artery here that's carrying blood to the brain. This is the plaque that's being removed by our very skilled surgeons. So this gives you an idea of the size of the plaque compared to the size of the artery. And the reason these people are having the surgery is they're at huge risk of losing blood flow to the brain. And that wouldn't be a good thing. So there's a lot of material here to study. Um, this operation is very common. It will be happening in all hospitals in the UK many times a day. Um, and then the third thing is um, in uh, the UK health service, patients have to wait a period of time before they have the surgery. So they're told you have to have the surgery, you have to go away and wait for the letter to come to surgery. And that can be some months. Now, that's good for us because it means we can do a study on those people while they're waiting for surgery. Okay? So we took advantage of all of those features to do a randomized controlled trial in patients awaiting that surgical procedure. Um, so it's a randomized controlled trial of EPA and DHA at 1.6 grams per day, so about 10 times what people would normally be eating, but an amount which could be achieved through eating a meal of fish. Um, in patients awaiting this uh, surgical procedure, 180 patients, they had to wait on average um, six weeks. Um, what we showed for the first time ever was that patients who were given omega-3 fatty acids end up with more omega-3 fatty acids in their atherosclerotic plaques. Um, so this is very interesting because um, these people have been building up plaques for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. We give them omega-3s for six weeks, and that's enough to change the chemical composition of the plaques. We also showed that patients who were given omega-3s had fewer inflammatory macrophages within the plaque, so there was reduced inflammation, at least according to that readout. And then the likelihood of a plaque being unstable when it was re removed at surgery was decreased by about 50%. So we believe we can stabilize plaques through giving people omega-3 fatty acids. That would lower the risk of heart attack, stroke, and so on. And that could explain some of the observations about uh, omega-3s in cardiovascular disease outcomes. This is the scheme I showed you before, where inflammatory activity within the blood vessel wall is causing um, uh, thinning of the plaque cap, making it vulnerable to rupture. These are the inflammatory cells that are driving this process. What we showed in that first study is if you give people omega-3 fatty acids, they have fewer of these inflammatory cells in the vessel wall. These are proteins called matrix metalloproteinases. The role of these proteins is to degrade this cap. This cap is like a net which the body has made to try to retain the growing plaque. If this is degraded, it becomes thin and more likely to rupture. So we wondered whether omega-3 fatty acids were affecting these matrix metalloproteinases in the blood vessel wall. To look at that, we had to do another study. Um, so we essentially repeated the study. Um, and it's a randomized controlled trial of patients awaiting carotid endarterectomy. And these are the amounts of seven different matrix metalloproteinases in the blood vessel wall. In the dark bars, if the patients received omega-3s. In the light bars, if they received uh, control. And you see the, the amounts of matrix metalloproteinases are always lower if the patients received omega-3s. These are other inflammatory markers which are usually lower in the patients receiving omega-3s than control. So these two studies show us, I think, that increasing omega-3 fatty acid availability leads to incorporation of those fatty acids into plaque advanced atherosclerotic plaques. This is linked to fewer macrophages, foam cells, and T cells. These are all inflammatory cells within the plaque. 
lower expression of inflammatory proteins, including important cytokines and matrix metalloproteinases. So we have less plaque inflammation, increased plaque stability, fewer events. So this could explain many of the observations made previously. The other aspect of our work, which I think is very important, is what happens over the life course. So in Southampton, we have a very strong emphasis on life course uh, 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 health. <clears throat> so the idea is, if you plot risk of a non-communicable disease, this could be cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, over time, this is the sort of thing that you will see. So as people age, their risk of these diseases go up. Typically what happens in medicine is you wait until people get sick and then you give them medications. And so you have a late intervention in patient groups and often those medications work to an extent. Okay? Another approach could be trying to get people onto different trajectories. So if we can do things early, that slows the onset of non-communicable diseases. So because I'm very interested in the immune system and inflammation, we've been very interested in this life course approach, not to a disease of old age, but to a disease which is important in children. It's also important in adults, but in children, which is allergic disease. So this is uh, just a systematic review where we looked at all of the evidence that was out there relating exposure to fish to oily fish, or to EPA and DHA, and risk of allergic disease in infants and children. And if you put all of this data together, it suggests fairly uh, convincingly that early intake of fish, oily fish, or omega-3 fatty acids reduces the risk of infants and children developing allergic disease. The second piece of information for the study I'm going to tell you about is the UK government advice from the second uh, document of 2004, uh, which made some statements about pregnant women for the first time for a dietary recommendation uh, in this area. Um, essentially, what the report says is that everybody should consume two portions of fish per week, at least one of which should be oily. And the report mentions several times that that advice also applies to pregnant women. That's emphasized many times in the report. So, what this means to me is the government's advice is that pregnant women should eat one or two portions of oily fish per week. Two portions, at least one of which should be oily. So we wanted to study, in a randomised controlled trial, what the effect of following the government's advice would be. Okay? Because no one has actually tested this in a randomised controlled trial. So we link those two things together, that early exposure to fish could reduce risk of allergic disease in children, and that pregnant women should eat up to two portions of oily fish per week. So we uh, carried out this trial. It's called Salmon and Pregnancy Trial, tra Salmon and Pregnancy Study. Um, it was funded by the EU as part of a Framework 6 project called Aquamax. So we uh, randomised uh, pregnant women who are at risk of giving birth to an infant who will become allergic. And that's either because the mother, the father, or one child, or one, one or more ch ch children already born were allergic. They were self-reported low oily fish consumers. We gave them salmon to eat twice per week from week 19 of pregnancy up until when they gave birth. The control group continued on their habitual diet. Um, how did these women incorporate salmon into their diet? They, they stopped eating so much chicken. So um, that was the simple thing they did. They replaced chicken with salmon. Um, the other interesting thing, of course, is these are women who wouldn't normally be eating salmon. So we had to go through various things to ensure that they did that, like giving them cookbooks and having a dietitian to advise them on how to cook salmon many different ways. Um, the other thing to ma make sure we had high compliance is we gave them enough salmon to feed the whole family twice a week. So that's a lot of salmon. And the salmon was especially farmed in Norway for our study. So this was high-quality salmon. 
Um, so these women gave three blood samples during pregnancy. We also took umbilical cord blood, umbilical cord tissue and placenta at birth and breast milk up to day 28. And we followed up the infants at uh, six months of age and two and a half to three years of age. So um, this is um, calculated EPA and DHA intake from fish in the control group, who of course didn't eat fish, and in the women receiving salmon. And what I've done here is, so this is from um, diaries that the women kept. So I think the compliance was actually very high in the study. And what I've shown here is the European Food uh, Safety Authority um, recommendation for EPA and DHA intake for non-pregnant adults, for pregnant women, and the UK minimum intake for all adults. And this is converted to a weekly intake, okay? So what you see is, and remember that uh, fish is the main source of these fatty acids, okay? So um, these women who are ostensibly healthy women living in Southampton uh, have an extremely low intake of EPA and DHA, way below any of the recommendations. But by eating salmon twice a week, almost all of the women for the entire period of the study meet the recommendation. So I think that again emphasizes eating fish is the key here. So I think that's an interesting observation. This is the amount of EPA in plasma phospholipids. So this is one of these blood lipid pools in those women at week 20, 34, and 38 uh, weeks. So one of the things that happens during pregnancy is the woman, the pregnant woman, transfers omega-3 fatty acids to the growing fetus. So it's been reported many times over that omega-3 status in pregnant women declines as pregnancy proceeds. And that's what we see here for EPA, and on the next slide you'll see it for DHA. So the mother is essentially giving up her EPA to the growing fetus. Now, that is good for growing the fetus, of course, but it may be that the mother suffers some health consequences as a result of that. What we see here is if that woman is consuming salmon twice a week, not only does she maintain her EPA status, but it actually increases over time. So I think that's important. There's enough for the fetus and enough for the mother. And this is DHA. So this is the reported drop in DHA that occurs in the blood of pregnant women. If they receive uh, salmon uh, twice a week, uh, that drop is prevented, and in fact, DHA status increases. So the mother has more EPA and DHA in her blood, and this is what's happening on the fetal side. So this is umbilical cord plasma phospholipids. EPA, this is the scale here because EPA is low on the fetal side, DHA here. So you see the fetus has much more EPA and DHA if the mother is uh, receiving salmon. This is breast milk DHA concentration. So after the baby is born, it's very important that the mother delivers DHA to the baby because DHA is very important for brain and visual development and probably other uh, tissue development. So we see right throughout one month of breastfeeding, the amount of DHA in <laughs> breast milk is higher if those mothers receive salmon during pregnancy. They stopped eating the salmon before this than if they were in the control group. So I think these are very important findings. Um, what about the clinical follow-up? So we finished the two and a half to three year follow-up a little while ago. Um, many things were not different between the two groups. But there are some things that look like they are a bit different between the groups. And one of them is doctor-diagnosed asthma. So this is about, I don't know the exact number, about 18% of children in the control group had asthma diagnosed by a doctor, and this was decreased to 2.5% if the mothers had eaten salmon during pregnancy. This fits with the findings of our systematic review from observational studies. So maybe it is true that eating salmon during pregnancy reduces the risk of developing allergic disease in the children after birth. What I haven't shown you is we measured a lot of immune factors in the umbilical cord blood, and many of these factors are linked to increased risk of allergic disease. And if the cord blood came from infants whose mothers had consumed salmon, they had lower amounts of these factors that predisposed to allergic disease. So I think there is a continuum in, in the data here. So what I've told you is that typical intakes of EPA and DHA are low in most people, resulting in low status. That intake and status of EPA and DHA can be markedly increased through consumption of oily fish, or through the use of supplements. 
We know a lot now about the patterns of incorporation of EPA and DHA in humans. Um, I showed you briefly that EPA and DHA act through multiple increasingly understood molecular and cellular mechanisms that affect cell and tissue function. Through those actions, EPA and DHA act to promote and maintain health and reduce disease risk and actually can be used therapeutically in some diseases. And I think the key thing is that maintaining a good EPA and DHA intake is important right through your life course. Um, you know, it's, it's important right from uh, pregnancy right through to, to old age. So I think just to finish, I would very much like to thank um, all the people who have worked with me over the years. There are too many to put on a slide um, uh, and have done really fine work. Um, I also would like to thank um, the excellent collaborations we have had, uh, particularly with the University of Reading, uh, but also with, um, with Susan's group in that very nice study that we did. Um, and also all of our funders. Um, so we've received... Um, a lot of funding historically from Food Standards Agency, from BBSRC, from EU programs, and from industry. And all of those things are really important for this sort of work, which really is translational and really uh, uh, trying to cover the life course. And finally, I thank you for coming to listen to me today. So you'll all um, join me in thanking um, Philip for such an interesting talk. I, I think we hear so much about sugar and other very niche aspects of diet these days. I think it's great to have to be reminded that fish is really important as well. And I think I, for one, will be going home and having some salmon tonight. <laughs> what Philip perhaps didn't say is that such a small proportion of people in this country actually consume any oily fish. I think it's about a quarter of yeah, people have any at all. Yeah. So for those of you that are not nutrition scientists, I think one message to take away from, from today is the importance of having some oily fish every week uh, for all sorts of reasons. So thank you very yeah, much, Rick. Philip. Thank you.